Have you ever been convinced that something was one way or that something was, going, something was headed in one direction and you were so sure that you knew what was going on and then you got this new piece of information and it totally changed your perspective on, every, on the direction that you thought things were going or it totally changed your perception on, on how you thought you were in a certain moment. We can get a new piece of information and it completely changes our perspective on maybe on where we are or what's going on or, or, or how we are with God or there's, there's lots of instances where we think we're headed in one direction or we think something is one way and then we get this new piece of information and it totally changes our perspective. We see that whatever situation we're in, totally different. This is called a reality check. And so this reality check is what we're going to talk about this morning. This morning I'm going to hope to give us, if the clicker will get us to the right place. Let's see. There we go. Huh? Huh? All right, reality check. Yeah, so a reality check is when you think something's happening one way and you get new information and reality, you, you, reality is revealed to you and you see it from a totally different perspective. I want to give you an example uh, from this last week uh, in my life where there was a major reality check. So last Sunday after church, went to lunch. It was Owen's birthday. We took him out to lunch. Then after that, I, I went uh, to, to Brian and Victoria, Victoria's reception for Brian Brown's dad, and I came back, uh, stopped by, ran a couple of errands, went home, and when I got home, it was, I don't know, uh, 2.30 or so. And uh, I had forgotten to get the cake for, for, for Owen. So I was like, all right, I'm going to go back and get the cake. So I get back in the car, drive back to town. And as I'm leaving, Aaron makes a side comment, hey, I haven't seen Clara in a while. And I was like, okay, well, you know, she, maybe she was down in the basement. We don't know, you know, whatever. So, so then I'm, I'm gone for about 35 minutes. And Aaron calls me, and I can hear the panic in her voice. And she says, Will, I can't find Clara. And I said, okay, well, maybe she's at the neighbor's. Her, our cousins live behind us. And, I said, and she's like, I've checked everywhere in the house, and I cannot find Clara. And when my wife says she's checked everywhere, it's, it's legit. She knows where everything is in the house. She knows how to search for stuff. She's the, she's the woman where you can say, Mom, do you know where you know, my, my glasses are that I got for Christmas nine years ago, and she say, yes, they're in your room on the third shelf on the right. Like, she knows where stuff is, but she did not know where Clara was, and I could hear a little bit of panic in her voice, and so I said a little prayer, and I was like, all right, well, I'm sure everything's going to be fine. So I go, and I get the cake, and then I come home, <laughs> and I come home, and Erin is standing in the kitchen, and her eyes are about this big, and she said, Will, I cannot find Clara. And I said, well, have you checked up at the neighbors? And she said, yes, we've checked the neighbors. Have you checked at our cousin's house? Yes, we've checked at the cousin's. And then I look down, and her feet are all wet, and her pants are all wet. She's walked down to the lake that's next to us to make sure that Clara's not down there. And she said, and the dog is gone, too. And, all right, and so then I'm like, my mind just goes all these pl terrible places. Like, where the heck is Clara? And so then, of course, being the man, I'm like, well, I need to search the house. So then I search the house, and I'm walking around, and we're yelling Clara's name at the top of our lungs. I'm looking in every single closet, under everything, and there is no Clara. So at this point, like, panic is starting to set in, and we're not the helicopter-type parents. Like, our parents have, our, our kids are running around all over kind of different places. And so we're talking, it was an hour. It was an hour of, we have no idea where she is, and we don't know how long she has not been where aware of her location. And so at this point, <coughs> at this point I call Ralph, and I've got a little panic in my voice, and I'm like, Ralph, it's been too long. Please pray. And the boys are out on the four-wheelers driving around. The neighbor and the neighbor's daughter are walking through the woods. We cannot find Clara. Like, it's becoming legitimate. Like, it's been over an hour, and it's been three hours since anybody has seen her. And we don't know where Clara is. And, the, and I, I'm starting to tear up. I'm starting, it didn't help that I had watched a, a serial killer documentary. <laughs> I had watched a serial killer docu documentary over the weekend. So you sort of fill your mind with these terrible things, right? And so, 
uh, it, it, was, it was a legitimate panic, and I'm like starting to paint this history in my head of what this is going to be like in the future, and w w missing posters, I mean, terrible, terrible, terrible things. Uh, and the boys are flying around in the woods on the four-wheelers screaming, and the cousins have come down on their ATV, and it's like search parties are forming in the woods, and we're, going, we're thinking, we don't, I'm looking at Amazon, like, when's the last time the Amazon guy call, came, can I call and see if he saw her? Like, it's crazy, crazy panic. And we keep thinking we're going to, you know, she's, gonna, she's just going to turn up, we're going to turn around, and she's there. And she was nowhere to be found for, for at least 90 minutes, and it was a terrible, terrible feeling. And so I'm over in the woods, I'm looking around in the shed, looking at the pool, thinking about going back down to the lake. And then Aaron walks into the kitchen. Aaron walks into the kitchen and Clara's standing there with the dog. And she, she's a little bit disheveled with her hair and she's kind of like looking around and, and Aaron's like, Clara, there you are, and like hugs her and there's like this coming outside and yelling of that we found Clara and calling off the search parties and calling the kids on their phones and telling them to come back and calling the neighbors, you can come out of the woods. And Clara's like, what, what's the, you know, she's, she's getting upset and she's, she's confused. She's like, what is the problem? And so here is the piece of information that we did not know, is that a, two weeks earlier we had taken a bunch of our outdoor furniture cushions and we had put them in this closet underneath the stairs. And Clara had made a tunnel underneath the cushion of the, of the outdoor furniture and had taken the dog down into this little tunnel fort that she had created and they both fell asleep. And so Clara was asleep underneath these cushions in this closet for over, for, uh, she was playing there for an hour and then fell asleep and was probably asleep for 90 minutes or so, completely safe, completely secure, completely warm, doing what she loved, playing with the dog. But our perception was serial killer, nightmare, search parties, bloodhounds, motorcycles. We, we were ramping up for this big, you know, hard target search of every, out, every outhouse, you know, what is that from? Fugitive, right? We were going to do a hard target search of the surrounding four miles to find her. But the reality of the situation was <coughs> she was safe and warm in the basement playing with her, do playing with her dog, doing what she loved. And so that piece of information completely changed my perspective on the last two hours preceding that. It completely, and it took some time to sort of deprogram from, from the mode that we were in. Like all of a sudden everything was fine and it wasn't that she wandered off and needed a lecture and it wasn't that she went somewhere that she didn't have permission. It wasn't that, you know, there was anything that she did that was wrong. She was just being herself, enjoying her, enjoying her house and enjoying her dog. And it completely changed our perspective. It was a huge reality check for us. It completely changed our perspective. And I think that that's really what, that's really what Peter is trying to do here in 1 Peter, is he's trying to give us a reality check. He's trying to, <clears throat> as he calls us to do things and calls us to, to react a certain way, he wants to give us, he reminds us of this information. He gives us new pieces of information about how we are with God so that when he tells us to do something and when he tells us to act a certain way, he continues to give us these reality checks. And we need these reality checks. We need this, this waking up with this information on a constant basis to bring us back to the reality of who we are with God, how we have it with God, what he has done for us, and how it is that we are with God. Because otherwise, we get all this other information from all these other places, from the world and from sin coming at us, and we start to get a skewed perspective of what is going on. <clears throat> Just like I had a skewed perspective of those two hours on that, Saturday, on that Sunday afternoon. The reality was is that my daughter was safe and warm and enjoying herself, but I had created this other reality of all of this danger and, ter and my mind had taken me and my emotions had taken me terrible, terrible places. So Peter reveals his, his heart for reminding us in, in 2 Peter, 
in 2 Peter, he says, So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. So that's Peter's heart for writing 1 Peter and 2 Peter. He wants us to remember and be, even though we know these things and we're firmly established in the truth, we need to refresh our memory of who God is and how it is that we have, how it is that we are with God and this wonderful grace that he has given us. And that's really what we're doing on Sunday morning, right? So we go throughout our week and the world comes at us and there's conflict and there's, there's relationships and there's issues that come up. And over time, we can forget how it, is that we, how it is that we really are. We can forget what really reality is. And so Sunday morning is a great reminder of this reality. We need these reality checks in our lives because we sometimes forget what is really going on. You know me, I love diagrams, so I kind of wanted to show you a diagram of what I, what I sometimes think uh, our perception of reality is, what our perception of, of life is like without these reminders as Christians, without this reality check of who we really are. So a lot of times, especially when there's conflict and when there's strife, like there was in, for the audience in First Peter in Asia Minor when their culture was coming at them and was hostile to them. A lot of times when, the, when sin in the world comes at us, we, we forget who we are and we think that this, this diagram is kind of just who we are. That of course we know we all have a body and then we have this soul, right? And our soul is our mind and our will and emotions. And so we're sort of just left, as uh, you see the arrows, the fiery darts coming at us, we're sort of left when sin in the world comes at us, to just react, to just react from our mind and react from our will and react from our emotions. But the reality check that, that Peter is trying to give us is that there is this whole other element to us. There's this whole other element to our identity that not only do you have a body and not only do you have a soul with a mind and will and emotions, but we've got a spirit. And you notice that this spirit is a huge white circle. This spirit is not a small part of us. This spirit is not a little thing that we talk about on Sunday mornings. But this is a, a mo much more accurate picture of who you are and how you have it with God. And as we've gone through 1 Peter, Peter has, has, has told us how it is that we have, have it with God in our spirit. And you'll see there in the center that we've got peace with God and that we have been born again with Christ's life in us. Uh, we talked about how we are a holy nation, that we have been set apart by God. We talked about how we've been redeemed by, by the blood of Jesus and that we are actually possessed. We are not only God's possession, but we are possessed by God via the Holy Spirit. And we are united with, our spirit is united with him and that we have, uh, we have been made new creations, and that this is a solid foundation for who we actually are. So unlike that prior uh, slide where we're just a bundle of emotions and we're just a body and we've got a mind and a will and emotions and we're just going to react to, to, what happens to what happens to us, we, we have to be reminded and have a reality check that there's a, a whole nother level of things going on. The most, we've talked about this before, the most real part of you is this spirit. That is the part that is permanent. That is the part that's going to go to heaven. Your mind and your soul, your mind and your will and emotions are, are just that. They are just reactors. They are just things that, that receive stimuli and, and, and respond back. That is, we relate to each other through our minds and our will and our emotions. But who you actually are is this spirit. This, this spirit that has been made alive with God. And so instead of reacting to our circumstances, what Peter is showing us is that in the midst of trials and in the midst of, of, 
of relationships with other people. We talked about government. We talked about marriage. We talked about work. Is that you don't? You're not just a bundle of neurons that is reacting to stimuli, that is reacting to what is going on. Because you have this spirit that is that is all these things in the center. You're able to reflect that out to the world, as opposed to reacting. We have an opportunity to reflect Christ, to reflect this spirit to other people, rather than just react to, to the sin and the world that happens to come at us. And so this is the reality check. This is the reminder that Peter is talking about in Second Peter. He's gone through systematically and told you who you are and how you have it with God. And then he tells you, because of that, here's how you should live. Here's how you should react to other people. So I want to spend just a couple minutes going through some of these reality checks in 1 Peter. So it starts off in 1 Peter 1. It says, you are born again to a living hope. Thank you for the extra waters, by the way. It's dry throat morning. You are born again to a living hope and have grace in abundance. So do not conform to the passions of your former ignorance. So you can see he's telling you not to conform to these passions, but the reason that you don't have to conform to these former passions is because, reality check, you are born again. You are in this new family. You've been born again to this living hope and have grace in abundance. And then later on in 1 Peter 1, he says, you have been made holy and have been ransomed from the feudal ways of your forefathers, So therefore, because of that reality, you can conduct yourself in a holy manner. Later on in chapter 1, he says, your souls have been purified by the truth, and you have been born again to this imperishable seed. This Instead of the perishable seed of Adam, you've been born again to this imperishable seed, which is Christ's life. So because of that reality... Love one another earnestly from this new heart that you have been given. In chapter 2, he says, You have tasted and have seen that the Lord is good. So because you have seen how good the Lord is and how good you have it with Him, then you don't need uh, to go down this, uh, these other routes. So put away malice and deceit and hypocrisy and slander. And then later on in chapter 2, going into chapter 3, he says, we went through this last week, or two weeks ago, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are possessed by God. So because of that reality, because that is true, abstain from the passions of the flesh and keep your conduct honorable and submit yourself to these human institutions, whether it be the government or your boss, or your spouse. So we see this connection between the reality of who we are, the reality of what God has done to us, the reality of what He has made us, and then He tells us how to be and how to act. But if you just come over here, if you jump past all of that and just go to, I need to be kind to people, and I need to love people, and I need to be honorable in my conduct, and I need to do this, and I need to do that, and it's not an expression uh, of, of this reality of understanding and believing and trusting in who you really are, and, it, and that is a, 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 all of that good stuff is a reflection of your belief and trust in what has happened. Then you get over here into self-effort and self-righteousness, and this is where you get burned out trying to be all of these things that God has called us to be and act all of these ways that Peter has, is telling us to act. Because the power to do that, the, the, engine, the engine to make that happen is this identity and belief and trust in who God is and what he has made you. All these wonderful things that how we have it with God is the fuel to, to, to live and love and serve and give from that new heart. Because if you think you have to deny yourself and, and be, try to be somebody that you're not, That is a treadmill that leads to nowhere except exhaustion. But this, understanding who you really are, is the engine to to love and serve and give uh, from your new heart. So Peter continues 
in chapter 3. We're going to finish up chapter 3 this morning, and he's going to give us a couple of more reality checks. And in the midst of those reality checks, he's going to tell us some other stuff to do and some other ways to be, other ways to conduct ourselves. But it is always in the context of this reality check for who you really are and what has really happened to you. All right, so uh, chapter 3, verse 8, he says, To sum up, all of you be harmonious and sympathetic, loving and compassionate and humble, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you would inherit a blessing. So these evil insults are going to come at you just like those red arrows that we saw and you have a choice. You have a choice just to react, just to react to that evil and return evil for evil or you have a choice to to acknowledge the spirit, acknowledge who you really are and reflect back and that is why you, you do not have to return evil for evil or insult for insult. It says you can actually give a blessing instead And why can you give a blessing instead? Because you have inherited a blessing. This this blessing of other people in the midst of this evil being done to you, the fuel for that is because you have already been blessed by God. And so we're going to see in a couple of verses where it's not that we don't care what happens to us in the world and that we're floating above it, but we can react differently. We can reflect because we have been made new. And this just makes sense. He quotes, he quotes Psalms here. He says, For the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against evildoers. So notice you can react this way. You you don't have to return insult for insult or evil for evil because the Lord is toward you. And it it is the Lord's job. It is the Lord's job for justice against these evildoers. The Lord's Lord's face is against evil. And he says if you you desire life and you want to see good days, then, then reflect this newness that you have. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Because, I mean, that just makes sense. If we're going to be lying to people and we're going to return evil to evil, evil for evil, then we're just in this mode of reacting to, to what's going on. And we have this opportunity to reflect and, and, and reflect this newness that we have. And if we do this, he says, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. So because of this reality, because of, of the, the opinion of the one that matters, thinks you are wonderful and has loved you and has died for you, then how is it that, when you, and you're zealous for doing good, who is it that can really harm you if the God of the universe is for you? But even if you do happen to suffer, even though you didn't do anything wrong, you will be blessed. And it says, do not have fear of them or be troubled. And this was very impactful for this audience. Remember what was going on with them. They were being incredibly persecuted. The Christians were blamed for the burning of Rome and they, they were being, the, 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 the culture was becoming more and more hostile towards these Jesus followers. They were being accused of things that they didn't do. And and evil was being done to them. And Peter is continuing to give them this reality check and remind them of who they are. He says, but in your hearts, in your hearts, honor Christ as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. So as we're reacting, I'm sorry, as we're reflecting uh, the Spirit out to people, they're going to notice. It says, be prepared. You need to be prepared because people are going to notice. People are going to notice that you're not just a bundle of reaction, 
that you're able to, to not return evil for evil and insult for insult because your meaning and identity and purpose is coming from who you are in Christ, you can then do these things that Peter is telling you. And then he's telling you, be prepared because people are going to notice. And what are they going to notice? They're going to notice that, you, that, that, that there's some hope within you that they don't have. And they want to know the reason for that hope. Why is it that you can react differently? Why is it that, that you don't return evil for evil and insult for insult? And how is it that you're able to, to love and to serve and give and you don't have any strings attached? You're not trying to get something from other people. You, you, people begin to notice when you have your meaning and identity and purpose and who you are in Christ rather than running on these hamster wheels of trying to find meaning and purpose in your job and in your kids and in your family and in your marriage. There's a, there's a hope that is within us that as we go out into the world and we interact, people are going to notice. And, and Peter's giving, giving us a, a heads up. Be prepared to, to make a defense or to, to help people understand this hope that you have. But do it with gentleness and respect. So if you try to browbeat somebody into believing this hope that you have, uh, it's, it's just not a good strategy. You want to you wanna be able to, to give an account or explain this hope that you have with gentleness and respect and not be condescending. How do you account for this hope that you have that is not found in the same things that I'm putting my hope in? Uh, people will notice that you're not putting your hope in the same things that they are. And they want to know they want to know why. And it creates an opportunity for us to share this reality, the reality of how we have it with God and the reality, this ministry of reconciliation that they can have with God too. He goes on and says, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. We talked about this a little bit a couple weeks ago. There's no glory in suffering for doing poorly. If, you, if you're an axe murderer and you go to jail, there's no false accusation there, right? You're in jail because of the actions that you, that you, participate, you participated in. You're, you're not really suffering righteously. You're suffering because you are being punished for a bad decision. So there's no glory in being punished for doing evil. But there is glory in being, in being punished even though your, your actions were good. And we, we, see, we saw that example two weeks ago with Christ. Obviously Christ was perfect and he did everything perfectly and he, lo he loved perfectly and yet he was falsely accused and, Im and imprisoned and tortured and murdered. Uh, and we have uh, that same God, that same Christ is in us. And so when we are falsely accused and when we are uh, persecuted, we can react like Christ did because we have Christ in us. It says, For Christ also suffered for sins once for all time, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. All right, so here's the reality check. He's told us don't return evil for evil. Don't insult people. You might be persecuted even though, you're being, even though you've acted well, even though you're righteous. You'll be persecuted for your righteousness. But then he reminds you, you can react how I'm telling you to react because this Christ that is in you, he suffered for your sins once for all time, so we're totally forgiven his just, he was just, and he, he died for, for the unjust. It says in other translations, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that he might bring us to God, so that we are with God, having put, being even, he was put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit. And our old self was put to death, and we are made alive. So he's describing that white circle to you. Again, it's this reality check of why we can react differently. We can reflect the spirit that is in us. It says, in which he also went and made proclamation to the, to the spirits in prison who were once disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. All right, so now he kind of pivots. All of a sudden he's talking about He's talking about Noah and the ark. And so, so what's going on here? 
So what, what, what's happening is Peter is, um, oh, I'm missing a page, so I'll just have to tell you. Um, so, so there's this idea uh, before the flood, we know that the Lord brought the flood because the world was, a, was an awful place and, and, and he kind of wanted to do this redo, right? And so, so Noah was being persecuted. He's reminding these people that Noah was persecuted. God had called him to act a certain way to build the ark. And so he, was, he listened to God and he did not listen to the, to the insults and, the, and he did not return that evil for evil. And he went into the ark and there was this washing there was this washing of the world. This old world was washed away, and this new world was washed, was brought. And he goes on and he says, uh, and he says, and this water, this idea of this, of this baptism, this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. So Noah's world, his old world was washed away and he was brought into this new world. And, and this, this is symbolizing in this chapter this baptism. But this baptism isn't just, just a water baptism this, this water is not just removal of dirt, but it is something so much better. Look at what this, what this death of this old man and rebirth of this new man does for us. It gives us a clear conscience towards God, and it saves us because of this resurrection. So how in the world can we have this clear conscience before God? This, this death of this old man and this birth of this new man, so that when we go to, to heaven at the end, we can have a clear conscience before God because Jesus is our life and Jesus is our track record and we are made alive in that white circle. That's where the Holy Spirit is. And so when we, when we stand before God, whether it's at the end times or whether after we die, we can have a clear conscience because our track record is Jesus' track record. So we see this second reality check here at the end of chapter 3 that he's telling people the world's going to come at you and sin is going to come at you and, and you're going to, in your mind and in your will and in your emotions, you're going to want to react. But remember, the reality is there's something so much deeper than just your mind and your will and emotions. There's this spirit that has been, and you have been baptized and, and your old self uh, ha has died and this new self has been risen and joined with God in your spirit and that is the most true part of you and that is the part of you that gets saved by the res resurrection of Jesus Christ and the reason that we have a clear conscience before God it says is because Jesus has gone to heaven and is at God's right hand so when the accusations of the enemy come and, and, when, and when the standard, the perfect standard to be in heaven is put up, we meet that standard because Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God and he says, that one's one of mine. That one's one of mine. I'm with him. He's with me. I'm in him. So he's good. His conscience is clear. His conscience is clear. Her conscience is clear because I'm in, I'm, I, have, I have taken that penalty. I have, I, have, um, I have taken that penalty and I have washed away all of the, the incompatibility with heaven and I have given them my track record. That one's one of mine. I, I, we have Jesus who's, who's more powerful than the angels and the authorities and, the, and powers are in submission to him and he is seated at the right hand of God interceding on your behalf. Hebrews 7 says, therefore he is able to save completely those who have come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. This is the reality of how it is with us and God and how it is that we can react in the ways that we are called because the one who reacts perfectly lives in us. Let's pray.